So thank you again for the invitation to speak. And I want to start with a very short comment about the overall talk. It's going to be a bit of an experimental thing in terms of rather doing than talking about, because me, myself, I don't have a attention span of longer than 10 minutes if someone is talking about something. And I'd rather try out something and then afterwards take questions um, what this is about or how that could be um, how could how that could be relevant to your practices visual artists or designers or architects so quickly a little bit about the background um, studying linguistics you work a lot on language right and i always felt there is a thing where language is being used very much in a very unidirectional way like only for telling something or only for giving only for informing people right however we are using language on a daily basis in so many different ways and i have the feeling whenever you try to theorize about that you are bound to fail so for me this is a little bit more about how I want to look at how artists work using language and also fail in different ways and how we could think of artists using language as also studio practice. So just to frame this again, for sure, or I hope you know, work on, uh, on decolonizing languages like uh, Gugi Wachongo, decolonizing the mind. And there's lots of important writing done on the decolonization and languages. I'm not going into detail here. This is a huge field and it would be really good for people who are interested. I can share these ideas. One of the more important sources for my work is South African linguist Neville Alexander, who is the founder of PRASA, which is a project of on democratizing, democratizing uh, language and the teaching of languages in South Africa towards uh, using African languages in tuition. So that is a huge issue across the different curricula. And I will go into detail, into more detail at the, towards the end of the lecture. I want to approach this through my own background, studying linguistics and was, when I was working transcribing artist talks and writing on artists and asking how can we learn about artists also art how can we learn about art discourse as part of art making and as i said before also as an opportunity to look at writing as learning from failing as learning from failing also how to speak about language or how to use language so the basic idea question i want to address is how can we think differently about writing a studio practice and um, i want to do exercises which consists of basically reading texts and to see if we can actually when we read and when we listen to texts by writers how can these speak to uh, studio practices of visual artists how can artists actually apply or do apply writing in their studio practice so there is for instance Teresa Hakrucha's uh, work Dikti, Yoko Ono's Grapefruit and I will share these uh, in a minute. Let me just frame this a little bit. This is a picture of my dad in the early 60s when he moved to Germany. So my dad is Palestinian. Uh, they left uh, Palestine in 48 and he moved to Lebanon. And so he's a migrant coming to Germany in the post-war Germany. And I find this picture one of the very few, very remarkable pictures of my parents because it really shows, you know, not a beautiful sight of the place where he moved to, right? There's a, some debris on the ground. The storefront in the background is not really pretty and it seems to be cold. And for me, this is one of the entry points for my own work in looking into my use of language, asking how. I learn about language through my dad's migrant language, migrant German, right? So asking how 
did, was, was my approach towards language actually pre-configured through someone who spoke a language that was perceived as deficient. Uh, just a side remark, I've been also doing a creative writing MA. I'm writing, uh, I'm trying to write through a bi biographical uh, creative fiction about these kind of issues. And I want to share with you one of my writings and then a few artists, so as to look at how do South African artists approach actually these kind of issues. So one thing I found in my dad's, uh, in my dad's files is a notebook from school and he was given a task to write I guess 100 times I am a lazy boy and he wrote it once. So here you see the notebook and this is where I'm kind of looking also at the technical conditions of writing both English and Arabic. You can see the Arabic is on the flip side because you start on the back. So that was part of the daily issues of writing when you are in Palestine or in Lebanon and growing up learning Arabic, French and English in school. Um, next, I'm going to share with you one as a preparation for later, a, a work by Teresa Hakyung Cha, who is a Korean artist who emigrated to the US and um, created in a few years the very influential work, visual works on uh, language and visual arts. So you see the French words wa and aveugle, which are printed on um, bandages. So wa means voice and it is across her eyes. Aveugle means blind and she's going to uh, use it to cover her mouth. I'm using my own writing to kind of inter interrogate my condition of basically asking what is it about my language, my use of language. And I actually want to try to find out how can I speak with artists who grew up with different linguistic backgrounds, using different languages at different times in their lives and how one can use writing to speak about that. So I want to read very quickly one of those very quick rants I'm writing and then move on to other sources. My dad's silences were speaking more eloquently of himself than words could. All my life I was oriented towards the material of his spoken language, the imperfect German he spoke, a detour as it pointed towards what I perceived a lack Seeing a lack, however, means seeing something what is not what could be, a distance between an existing sound pattern, a father speaking German with an accent ungrammatically, and the imagined ideal, what is not achieved, a father speaking perfectly German. This distance cannot be measured. It is an empty space of possibilities. It is filled with other knots. My dad never finished high school, did not matriculate, because he felt he was not good enough for the exam. The stretch in his imagination from where he was to where he could be was perceived as too large. He spoke more than six languages and thought that his own knowledge of Arabic was not perfect enough either. The realization of this perfect mastery of a language, however, is a colonial construct enshrined in A, grammar books, and B, white males who wrote these grammar books. They even write grammar books of what languages they don't know and get away with it which means in effect that the whole world perceives a lack against something, some imagined point of measure of mastery. And it is significant that people would accept the idea that there's anything such as perfect mastery of language, as, as if it was not something that humans do and learn, but something that has been achieved through technological means. And here I want to point out how the construction of humanities in higher education applies the higher curriculum of technological innovation of natural science. In Cartesian thought, scientific research strives to accomplish a mastery of clarity, which purports to deliver a detailed observation of nature in order to apply reason. Human fallibility is built in this model as the same distance of lack, a measure of failure to perform perfectly to observe the physical world. The scientific model claims to place methods in place 
which serves to A, observe and record, B, conduct experiments for ex empirical research, and C, to build an argument which claims to have managed to shorten the distance of perfect mirroring of nature, such as the laws of physics, function of organic or chemical world, etc. This dialectical process is seen as improving human, human faculties of understanding. It is a process which is learned, however, from metaphors and allegories, which are applied on the functioning of the technical reproduction of nature through photography, film, or sound recording, a perfect image of reality. However, from painting to cinematography, pigments and chemical processes determine the range of possibilities of reproducing colors. The mechanical production of colors from metal or nat natural plants or animals based to chemically produced pigments. Art history is structured by the processes of producing colors, ochre, purple, Prussian blue. The advance of te chemical processes in image making becomes visible in the revolution of Technicolor movie. Who can measure the distance from the colors we see in real life to the colors which are presented in technical reproduction of images? Which forms of visual art are successful depends not only on the advance of artistic and technological processes, but also the discourse of visual art. The curious thing about language is that it constructs, that it constructed from human made forms. Spoken language is, on the, is the basis for developing notation for reporting the languages in writing. On the basis of the study of language and its functions, linguists develop models of language which develop, describe the correct use of language in grammar and the correct way of speaking and pronunciation and the correct way of writing and orthography. However, language does not work the same way. As mathematics, one plus one equals two, cannot translate into rules. Language remains in flux and rules are broken in spoken language more than in written language. This gives rise to the assumption that written language is more technical and formal than spoken. At the same time, the same forms which are taught as grammatical resulted from studies in the history of language. And the archive forms a body of knowledge. It is a colonial archive and a wide body of knowledge. So this is just an example of one of my procedural writing of grappling with these kind of thoughts. And you will see um, I'm borrowing from artists and I want to read with you from, uh, before I go into other artists' examples, um, I want to read with you uh, from Teresa Hakyum Cha, and here I can go into uh, full screen. Um, Teresa Hakyum Cha is, uh, as I said before, a Korean artist who migrated to the US and very tragically was murdered too early in um, 82. This is an excerpt from her book, uh, Dictee, which was published. Uh, and is available also in uh, libraries. Uh, it contains poetry, uh, writing, and also images. I must also apologize for my bad pronunciation of English as well as French and all the other languages which are coming up. This verse, which is French for speaking. She mimics the speaking that might resemble speech, anything at all, bad noise, groan, bits torn from words. Since she hesitates to measure the accuracy, she resorts to mimicking gestures with the mouth. The entire lo lower lip would lift upwards, then sink back to its original place. She would then rather both lips and produce, she would then gather both lips, sorry, and protrude them in a pout, taking in the breath that might utter something, one thing, just one, but the breath falls away. With a slight tilting of her head backwards, she would gather the strength in her shoulders and remain in this position. It murmurs inside, it murmurs. Inside is the pain of speech that pain to say. Larger still, greater than is the pain not to say, to not say. Says nothing against the pain to speak. It festers inside, the wound, liquid, dust, must break, must void. From the back of her neck, she releases her shoulders free. She sw swallows once more. Once more, one more time would do. In preparation, it augments to such a pitch. Endless drone refueling itself. Autonomous, self-generating. 
swallows with last efforts, last wills against the pain that wishes it to speak. She allows others in place of her, admits others to make full, makes warm, all barren cavities to make swollen, the others each occupying her. Tumorous, good luck switching the pay, oh my God. Um, tumorous layers expel all excesses until in all cavities she is flesh. She allows herself caught in their threading, anonymously in their thick motion in the weight of their utterance. When the applications stop, their mind be an echo. She might make the attempt then, the echo part at the pause, when the pause has already soon begun and has rested there still. She waits inside the pause, inside her, now, at this very moment, now. She takes rapidly the air in gulfs in preparation for the distance to come. The pause ends. The voice wraps another layer, thicker now even, from the waiting. The pain, the wait from pain to say, to not to say. She would take on their punctuation. She waits to service this, theirs, punctuation. She would become herself, demarcations, absorb it, spill it, seize upon the punctuation. Last air, give her, her, the relay, voice, a sign, hand it, deliver it, deliver. She relays the others, recitation, evocation, offering, provoking, the begging, before her, before them. Now the weight begins from the uppermost back of her head, pressuring downward. It stretches evenly, the entire skull expanding tightly, all sides toward the front of her head. She gasps from its pressure, its contracting motion. Inside her voids, it does not contain further. Rising from the empty below, pebbles, lumps of gas, moisture begin to flood her, dissolving her, slow, slow to de deliberation, slow and thick. The buff traces from her head moving downward, closing her eyes in the same motion, slower parting her mouth open together with her jaw and throat, which the above falls, falling just to the end, not stopping there but turning her inside out in the same motion, shifting complete the whole way to elevate upward. Begins imperceptibly near perceptible, just once, just one time and it will take. She takes, she takes the pause, slowly from the thick, the thickness, from weighted motion upwards, slowed to deliberation, even when it passed upwards through her mouth again, the delivery, she takes it slow, the, invocate, the invoking all the time now, all the time there is always and all times, the pause, uttering hers now, hers bear the utter. So this is uh, just an, uh, the first two pages of um, the, book, exit full script. So this is just the first two pages of uh, the book thesis by Teresa Hakim Cha. And I would really um, want to continue rather now with looking at a few examples, which I found by South African artists, looking at the use of language and how actually language is really something that is, um, that is an issue and how do South African artists go into the question. So um, there is, for instance, uh, South African artist Shadin Khan, who works in her artworks through words and through the making of words and through the performativity of words as an embodied knowledge. In her series, What I Look Like, What I Feel Like, uh, you see a juxtaposed uh, image of herself as a as an evil creature, westernized, educated bitch, and assigned with other uh, concepts of othering. 
And so the whole series actually goes through these kind of different ways, how people are othered in not only stereotypes, but also in language, the performativity of language. So with each time uttering any of the words, the embodied knowledges of othering someone are being performed again and again. And so I think a lot of South African artists actually work on this in the most amazing ways. And I think um, it hasn't been yet really discussed or researched uh, theoretically how one actually could think about this as a performative practice. Um, Shalin Khan also has um, published a book which is um, called I Make Art, where she goes through all these kind of um, through this kind of complex intersectional problem of um, performativity, language, and the visual. And I'm going very sketchily through a few other artists just to see, just to show in a way how language is a repeating and a reoccurring issue in the in South African art world. So you have another example is uh, Lerato Shadi, who that was shown at the National Arts Festival, who um, in the piece Sugar and Salt um, licks sugar with her mom licking salt and then actually touching the tongues to see what is the mother tongue to actually go into this issue of what do we speak? How do we pass on words bodily? Uh, there is also uh, Piliswa Lila, Pretoria-based now, artist who at an exhibition in 2016 in Makanda uh, showed the piece TikTok, uh, deconstructing words to the point that they are not being recognized. And I want to try to show actually a piece of her, um, ex of her performance. Now, our actions justify tasks for justice. What harm is justice? Should it be now like hatred? Just come inside and read. Just take a picture there. Can you scream? Oh, could you scream? Yeah. Which level is it? Doesn't matter. Just read. So that was an exact uh, excerpt of that performance. Uh, Police Walila also had recently an exhibition opening. And then um, most, I'm sure you also saw the uh, the roads must fall, fees must fall, uh, protests in 2015 60, where Setembili Mezane performed a uh, piece during the removal of the statue, and uh, the, um, which was followed by a whole other series of uh, performances, also by the Ishtria um, Collective. So, the question of embodied knowledges and of how is language has language become an embodied knowledge in South African in South Africa and through the colonization of South African uh, languages is a huge topic, as I said before, and is being interrogated in recurringly. For instance, also by Donna Kukama in the recent series of works. Um, I'm showing just one example, which was shown at Blank Project, entitled "And the Same Soil: This Very Restless Soil Wishes It Could." Spill out all the bloodshed, repeating in the gesture that what is the writing. And I want to actually really go in, in a conversation which I hope we can have uh, soon to look at that what's happening when you speak or write as something that is a bodily practice, not so much aimed at the information or at the signification, but also that is something that is forming something as a practice. Um, 
another artist, Farasale, um, does a lot of uh, performative works questioning the dislocation of Palestinians and also the question of the body in dislocation. Um, and uh, you as American artist Trisha Brown has become very known. She's also contemporary of other um, choreographers like Yvonne Reiner, uh, interrogating the body in space by, as you can see here, for instance, placing charcoal on feet and hand and then creating, uh, creating lines on a huge piece of paper on the floor and to see what kind of signs the body creates in movement. Um, I'm going to continue now to read another piece, um, which I want to share with you, which is by Filipino artist, uh, filmmaker and artist, uh, Trinti Minha. And it is called, um, it's from, from the book, when the moon waxes red. So the beginning is in French and I will loosely translate it. It is by West um, African author Amadou Hampateba uh, piece and it starts Conte, Conte à Conte et tu vérité. So say to tell, to narrate, are you true? Um, she's going back in the rest of the text to this initial citation. So let me just read through what um, Trinity Manha has to say about that. In these, the opening lines of a didactic narration, which forms part of the traditional education in the Fulani in the Nidia loop, what can be read as unwinding itself to the reader are some of the most debated issues in contemporary theory and art. Tale to be told, tale told to be told. Are you truthful? Acknowledging the complexities inherent in any speech act does not necessarily mean taking away or compromising the qualities of a fine story. Simple and, and indirect in its indirectness, it neither wraps itself in a clown of oratorial precautions nor occurs nor cocoons itself in realist illusions that make language the simple medium of thought. Who speaks? What speaks? The question is implied in the function named, but the individual never reigns and the subject slips away without naturalizing its voice. She who speaks, speaks to the tale as she begins telling and retelling it. She does not speak about it. For without a certain word of displacement, speaking about only partakes. Sorry, I lost the line only partakes in the conversation of systems of binary opposition, subject, object, I, it, we, they, on which territorialized knowledge depends. It places a semantic distance between oneself and the work, oneself the mater, maker and the receiver, oneself and the other. It secures for the speaker a position of mastery. I am in the midst of a knowing, acquiring, deploying world. I appropriate, own, and demarcate my sovereign territory as I advance, while the other remains in the sphere of acquisition. Truth is the instrument of a mastery which I exert over areas of the unknown as I gather them with the fold of the known. Speaking to the tales questions the dualistic relation between subject and object as the question who speaks and the implication it speaks by itself through me is also a way of foregrounding the anteriority of the tale to the teller and thereby the merging of the two through a speech act. Truth is both a construct and beyond it. The balance is played out as the narrator interrogates the truthfulness of the tale and provides multiple answers. So I'm, I just want to stop here. I mean, this is really, uh, long chapter in the book, there's much to unpack. What I want to only point out here is what I find compelling in this book is how Trinity Minha actually moves the story away from telling about something but speaking through something, which is also moving away the language from something that is being transmitted as if it's in a box and you give it to someone, but that is something that is shared through the 
experiencing the language as something that has happened through the bodies. Um, I'm sure that there are lots of questioning coming, questions coming up or that this is not really very clear right now. Just want to give a short example of my own work currently, which is also in the readings, where I'm now trying to rework my own autobiographical fiction writing through the use of personal um, Super 8 uh, films, which my father took uh, in the 70s. So I will just share one more vi uh, short video and then uh, we will go to the questions. Working the four o'clock morning shift at Frankfurt Airport. I'm not sure if my sleepy state of mind or the sunrise that made me feel like a mini big late runner. The wide air over the runway, watching the reflection of lights in the large glass panes while I listened to the building waking up. Airports are containers of experiences similar to railway stations and bus terminals. The reason runways are of limit is that gravitation fluctuates there, synchronized with the starting and landing of planes. After the war started in Lebanon, my father stopped working for the Middle East Airlines. Previously, I had visited family in Beirut each summer. Now we would find our holiday locations on TV, different but closer. Since I started working here, I've been listening to the building stories. It keeps talking, how it operates the doors, opening and closing over and over again. I listen to its voice, sucking in and breathing out air, the business ventricles, its breathing tubes and vocal cords. A sleeping dragon. It speaks to me, this gigantic organism which hovers over our lives, draws them in and processes them, feeding on people, funneling them into airplanes and spying on them as they pass, scanning them, weighing them, and picking up their smells. In my line of work, people think about air travel and security when they surrender their baggage. But I know it impregnates suitcases and turns them to eggs, traveling bags and trunks glued onto conveyor belts like utricles. These bags are sniffed and sorted by the airport to decide who matches whom. It's no coincidence when shuttles accelerate or escalators and elevators slow down or maintenance work disrupts the passage. It is the airport arranging for people as if by accident. Then it waits for the offspring, which it accepts as its own. It watches over us as we pass and probes for signs of happiness or fear, detects sense of distress, and takes care we arrive safe. My parents were a match made by an airport. As it sorted their baggage, it knew how long to delay the boom gate of the pickup to ensure they would end up sharing the same care. 